Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this workshop, the California Prisoners' Hunger Strike Leadership and Power for the Movement for Prisoners' Rights and Against Solitary Confinement. Family members speak out and tell the real story. My name is Margaret Prescott. I'm with Women of, of Color in the Global Women's Strike. I know some of you have also seen me with the press badge and recording. I'm also the host of Sojourner Truth, a nationally syndicated show on Pacifica Radio. Now, um, the people who are presenting in this workshop are part of a national and international grassroots delegation of campaigners that a number of us in the Global Women's Strike and Women of Color of the Global Women's Strike and Payday Men's Network worked very hard to get to the left forum. I think there are about 30 something of us uh, all together and a number of different areas. The families of, of uh, prisoners of the hunger strikers, welfare rights campaigners, campaigners on caregiver giving work, anti-war campaigners, campaigners in support of whistleblowers, um, queer strike, and a number of other uh, delegations uh, campaigners because we wanted to make sure that the voices of those of us who are impacted by a lot of the issues that are discussed at the left forum or written about by presenters at the left forum actually are here to be able to speak in their own names, yes. okay, yes. the ones who are directly yes. impacted. Yes. So that's why we did the, the broad range of delegations. The other thing is that we also know that all of these things are interrelated, poverty, prisons, and war. And that if we are going to win in one area, we c it's really <laughs> impossible to win in one area without the other areas. And also, with uh, looking beyond the immediacy of where we are in New York City or in the United States, but also to have a view to what's happening to our sisters and brothers in other parts of the world, including in the global south. So uh, that was another job we did with the delegation in bringing movements that are usually in our own corners together um, not to um, undercut or negate or take away focus from specific areas like ending solitary confinement or welfare rights, but to in fact strengthen those movements and to see how they're connected one with the other. So I also wanted to briefly, by opening the, the panel and introducing the panelists, to say why specifically we were so anxious for the family members of the California prisoner hunger strikers to be here. And other family members is a, a member on the uh, panel with the Dallas Six. Uh, but also that we worked really, really hard to convince the left forum organizers that Dolores Canales of California Families Against Solitary Confinement, one of the spokeswomen for that organization, have a voice in the plenary session. It's one thing to speak at a workshop, and it's another thing to be able to send a message to the thousands of people participating in those plenaries. So after a lot of negotiation, we managed to get five minutes for Dolores Canales at the plenary this evening. So we invite all of you to be there and to tell your friends about it. So why did we do all of that work? Because those of us in our women's network, we are with the prisoners. We want to make that absolutely clear. The prisoners who have put their lives on the line have had in the hunger strike 30,000 strong what other movement do we know of in the United States outside has had a strike of 30,000 strong and they did it from behind prison walls? For 60 days, they put their lives on the line. They have provided incredible insight. They have provided direction. They have provided leadership, not only for the movement for the rights of prisoners and against prisons, but for all of our movements, whatever our corner of the movement is, and I'm going to quickly um, say a couple of things how, because it explains why we did that work and why we are doing this work. The hunger strikers plan very carefully. They study very carefully under the worst of circumstances, and they've figured out a way of communication among them 
prisons across California participated in, in the hunger strike. They've organized across racial divides, okay? Black, brown, white, Native Americans. And when the, um, the mainstream media tried to discredit the hunger strike, y'all remember that, by saying, oh, well, Todd Aker, one of the uh, leaders, the five leaders out of Pelican Bay, when he went in prison, he was a white supremacist. Well, that goes to show you how political you could become within prison, that this man who was formerly a white supremacist is now organizing with Marie Levin's brother and black and, and brown people and standing against racism. That should teach us something on the outside. Yes. Um, also, um, they call for cessation among hostilities, among the races. And that made the level of organization and the effectiveness of participation of the hunger strike possible. And Georgia, there was a hunger strike in Georgia that was also statewide. Okay, to, in 2011. And in California, the hunger strike last year was the third. Now, the Afro leadership, the black leadership in the hunger strike, must have recognized that given the power that black people in this country have built over decades of resistance and slavery, I'm not saying that we control the halls of power or we control the economy of this country, but I think you all know what we're talking about. There was a civil rights movement, a black movement, yes. slave rebellions, one of the largest led by Haitians in New Orleans, okay? Um, so there's been a whole history of resistance and they must have recognized that that power and that history that we bring to struggle has to be available to the Latino and Hispanic, our Latino and Hispanic brothers and sisters because black-brown unity, I'm not saying only black-brown unity, but black-brown unity is really central yes. in this struggle because that is part of how they're carving us up because if they could keep us black and brown people from each other who are going to be after all the majority of this country in, in terms of population then they've got you know, figure that they will have a victory, but we're not going to allow that. Um, they also uh, showed us, as I said, that it's possible to make an anti-racist struggle across racial divides. And I just want to say that the racial divides are exacerbated. I don't want to say they don't exist, because there's a lot of crap and racism on all sides. You know, black folks talking about, oh, they're coming over here, these immigrants, and taking our job, and they live in 10 people together in South LA. Like, what happened when you came from the South? You know, live in 10 people <laughs> in South LA. So, and there, so there, there are issues on both, um, on both sides, but, um, you know, just to say that the prison authorities and prison policy, they promote these divides within the prison. And then a lot of those divides within the prisons then spill over onto the streets, all right? So that they call for that cessation of hostilities. I'm not going to say uh, more about it. I'm sure the panelists will. So not only did they provide leadership by literally putting their bodies on the line with a 60-day hunger strike, but since the hunger strike, they have continued to provide leadership um, not only for those inside, but for those of us on the outside. Whether it's legislation that they study very carefully and they say we want this and we don't want that and we want you on the outside to do this and that. But they've also issued three action plans, um, not only, by the way, for those of us in California, because my sisters who are from here in London, when they saw the action plans, they were like, oh my God, this is fantastic. This is something that we could all use wherever we are in the world to build our movements. The prisoners, of course, cannot be here, but we wanted to make sure that their family members are here. You know, there are women in California, families against solitary confinement. The core of them and the, the leadership of them are women. They are overwhelmingly women and I don't think that could, should be, that really needs to be underscored and understood for what that means. And this slogan we have here, mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, we've actually added in partners, wives, fighting for our loved ones lives because we know it is often the women who are at the forefront for justice. Now you see they um, folded it over because at the bottom 
it said global women's strike because this was a slogan that was developed and that not just a slogan but it really is a, a way of thinking about things and a way of struggling because the um, uh, folks here wanted to be very careful not to give the impression that this is a global women's strike workshop, okay, because it isn't. It's a family members workshop that we have helped to facilitate, but I just wanted you to know where this came from. And the moment Dolores and Delith and all of them saw it, they were like, yes, mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, loving um, that particular thing. Okay, so the family members during the hunger strike I don't know how they did it. They were tireless in support of the hunger strikers. They were doing pro several protests a week. They were holding press conferences. They were out in Norwalk. They were, at, you know, California is very spread out. They were all over the, the damn place. Can I say that? You know, sometimes they would have two or three protests a day. A day. That's how tireless they were make, uh, talking to anybody they could talk to, from the media to everybody else, about supporting the hunger strikes and their five demands, but also the conditions and the impact of um, the, the solitary confinement and the torture of prison on their families and, in fact, on entire communities. They spelled out that cost of having loved ones inside, and not only inside, but those who are campaigning on the inside. Okay, now they also have refused to divide between the good prisoners and the bad prisoners as defined by some in the prison rights movement. And I know that that's somewhat controversial, but they believe as do us in the strike. All prisoners are political prisoners in these yeah, United yeah. States. We've got nearly 3,000 uh, more in solitary. So what are we talking? Some are more deserving than others? We don't think so. No. Um, they take their direction from prisoners, and so do we. Now, it doesn't mean that campaigns against specific conditions within prisons, the expense of phone calls, campaigns for individual prisoners, and more, are not important because they are. They are all moving in the same direction, but something has shifted. And sometimes when you go to these forums and you go to, out to where the progressive or the left movement, however people want to define themselves, have gathered, or even those who are working against mass incarceration, People are proceeding like nothing has happened. Well, excuse me, a big thing happened. 30,000 prisoners went out on hunger strike for 60 days. They almost died. In fact, one died. That has got to change everything that we're doing. You can't bypass it as though nothing happened. This has been the greatest working class struggle that I know I've seen. When have we seen such a working class struggle? Are we going to ignore it? Are we just going to move on like business as usual and nothing happened? The struggle that those guys made, their organs at the, the, the point of collapse, Bobby Sands, that great Irish struggler, the Irish hunger striker, after 66 days, Bobby Sands died. They were at 60. That's the level of their commitment. What about our commitment out here? Yeah. Um, the competition between campaigns has to stop. What has happened, um, let's see, I don't want to repeat myself here, but I didn't want to forget anything. Um, so it's shocking how many people, even here at this left forum, haven't even heard of the hunger strike. Or if they've heard about it, they don't think it's a big deal. I want to congratulate those of you who are here because you're here because you do think that this is something that you want to know more about. Um, finally. We support the autonomy of families from professionals and non-governmental organizations. <laughs> A lot of y'all know what I'm talking about. The lawyers and other professionals are very helpful. You know, they have to do some of the stuff that we cannot do, but they must not lead our movement. Right. The prisoners have to lead the movement. Right. And their family members must be their best representatives right. on the outside. Yeah. And the main campaigners, okay. Yeah, yeah. And also, I wanted to say something about the non-governmental organization. Somebody in a workshop, a young woman in a workshop I was in on poverty yesterday, got up and spoke as a young woman and how a whole generation of young people who are being trained 
into thinking that working in the movement for change means getting a wage to manage the movement. That has been a problem. The enjoyization of the movement has been a major stumbling block to all of our movements from domestic violence to rape to internationally, like in Haiti, Palestine, indeed, everywhere around the world. You know, when the U.S. State Department goes somewhere now to occupy, they go in with a whole slew of NGOs, anti-rape and for women's rights. Remember how concerned they were about the women in Afghanistan? The U.S. State Department, USAID, you know, setting up some fake Twitter account in Cuba. They're involved in all kinds of mess, all righty? Um, so we have to keep our eyes open and take our direction from the prisoners. They're so compassionate in how they deal with their supporters. They said from the onset that they were on hunger strike, not only against their own conditions, dig this, we are on hunger strike, not only for our conditions and torture, but for prisoner, other prisoners and oppressed people around the world. Is that a fantastic struggle? Is that fantastic leadership coming from the loved ones of these family members? Okay, finally, I'm really on that note. I really want to explain why we did that work and why it's so important for these voices to be heard. I'm really delighted to introduce the women who fought for and are continuing to fight for and be the voice of their loved ones on the inside. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the uh, order of the speakers and to tell you a little about them. Delifa Hayden, the first on my left here, the mother of a hunger striker, her son was on hunger strike, she's a member of California Families Against Solitary Confinement. She will be followed by Maribel Herrera, who says she's only here because her uncle, along with all the other hunger strikers, need her. Isn't that something? Right now. Right, and I'm sure she realizes she needs them. And she's a member of California Families Against Solitary Confinement. Our fourth uh, speaker will be Chandra Delaney. She is with families of the Dallas Six, based out of Pennsylvania, and the Human Rights Coalition, a family member, has a loved one struggling on the inside. All right. And our final speaker is Dolores Canales. She is a co-founder of California Families Against Solitary Confinement. She's on the advisory board of Californians United for Responsible Budget, and she's the mother of a prisoner in solitary for the past 13 years. Okay, so on that note, I will stop and open it up, and just to let you know that the speakers will go for about uh, seven to 10 minutes, and then we really want to have plenty of time for discussion and questions, but also some follow-up action plans, and see what are we gonna do on the outside. So let us give a warm welcome for Delita Hayden. Well, I'm, first of all, I'm going to apologize ahead of time um, because this is a very emotional um, subject for me. My son has been in prison for 13 years. This is what's brought me to the struggle. He's a wrongful conviction, he's life without parole, and he spent over six years um, in solitary confinement. So after hearing all the other, um, you know, attending the other workshops and listening to not only at the academic side, but those that have been inside and spent time uh, in prison and in solitary confinement, it's, it's overwhelming for me. And, you know, I think that I would be past that, but you just don't. Um, I came to uh, CFAS, California Families Against Solitary Confinement, um, at its conception, I went to Sacramento for following a lead for a prison, um, a prison newspaper that my son had seen an article in, just so that I could find out where I could begin to support him and 
be more a part of the struggle and looking for those that were suffering the same kinds of injustices that I was experiencing and the isolation. I was very fortunate to have uh, the timing just prior to the July 2011 hunger strike uh, to be in Sacramento. I met Dolores and uh, several other ladies that have co-founded CFASC and um, we held each other together through those first two hunger strikes. And um, now we're just looking to bring awareness to the public be the voices of our loved ones because we are listening directly to them. We're taking our cues for, from them. We're standing for them. They've had the foresight, as Margaret said, to come together, crossing all racial barriers. My son himself is biracial, um, but they wanted to dispel the myths that they're not human beings, because they are. They love, they care, and they want to be treated as human beings. So they, without being forced, want to dispel that myth, myth also that they were forced by gang efforts to participate in this hunger strike. My son participated in this hunger strike because he spends 23 hours a day, sometimes 24 hours a day, in a cell. I'm thankful that he's not in Pelican Bay because he does have a slit of a window where he can at least see the sky. Because in Pelican Bay, you are underground, basically. Um, there are no windows. You're in a concrete cell. When you do go out for your so-called recreation, it's in another concrete cell. And I'm in constant, my son is under constant threat of being sent to that worst place. So even being here, I've checked my iPad in the locator to make sure that he hasn't been moved before I get back. Um, because they are doing a lot of moving things around because our men have, um, they've stirred things up to where they are having to, you know, CDC is having to have some accountability. So um, as a result of the hunger strike, they are implementing programs that um, are making some changes just how good those changes will be is still um, still in the works. But our primary reason is to just raise awareness and work to restore justice and have accountability for the California Department of Corrections. And as I said, my son wanted everyone to know that he did not go on a hunger strike because higher up so-called gang members or associates pressured him. He did it because of the conditions that he lives in, because he doesn't want to see other young people come to prison as we have the school to pipeline prison situation going on. There's so many issues that are going on um, that are bringing our children, our loved ones to prison and even the possibility of ourselves. Because it seems, listening to all of these various groups, all roads lead to prison. And um, we have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of that and support one another. Um, and let the rest of the public know that this is the, the path that we're on. So after the 2011, hunger strike, they came together again with more wisdom that our politicians could use, the end of hostilities, which Margaret had mentioned already. 
they no longer wanted um, CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, which there is none, to be able to divide them and cause conflicts and keep them oppressed by them fighting amongst one another. And they want that to go out into the streets. So in October of 2012, they um, put out a press release and we as family members were out there on the corners rallying to let the rest of the world know that they no longer want to fight amongst each other and they wanted to share that with the others on the streets so that they would carry that on and if they did end up in prison that they didn't come there with that attitude so that they could progress for better conditions. So with that bit of history, during the during the hunger strike, they had five core demands. They wanted to end group punishment and administrative abuse. Number two, abolish the debriefing policy and modify active inactive gang status criteria. Debriefing is where uh, one inmate is encouraged to inform, be a snitch on others so that they can get privileges or get themselves out of solitary confinement. There are only two ways to get out of solitary confinement and that is to debrief, basically snitching on someone else, or to die because the way things are set up now with solitary confinement, you can be sent to solitary confinement for a tattoo, for a drawing. My son is in solitary confinement over a drawing of an Aztec warrior. So, as you can tell, they're using anything and everything. Tattoos, uh, a card from another inmate. Um, one young man was in there because they had actually passed out, a, a, they had come along, just be, in fact, just before I had visited my son one day, and they handed out books on a cart. Then a few minutes later, they came back to that inmate and validated him saying that the book that he had in his possession had the name of a validated gang member. And so he became validated. You can um, be evaluated every six years because being validated as a gang member or associate, like I'm sitting here, hello, respects. Now I've become a gang associate. Um, and you can become, you're in there indefinitely. So every six years they'll give you a, a review, but when your sixth year comes up and they, they will look through everything and say, well, you're still associated with the gang. Although you're in a cell 23, 24 hours a day, you're still an associate of the gang. Although the only person you've had any contact with is a prison guard, you're still an associate or a member of a gang. And they will continue. That's why there are so many that are in there for decades. Like I said, my son's been in there over six years and when I see how long so many others have been in there, I was not feeling encouraged. So the other, the third uh, thing that they were asking for is comply with U.S. Commission on Safety and Abuse in America's Prisons 2006 recommendations regarding the end to long-term solitary confinement. Well, there have been many, many studies. That's why I'm just so exhausted when they say, well, we're going to do another study and determine what the effects of solitary confinement are. There are so many studies that are out there. They've done studies themselves that they've commissioned and spent more uh, millions of our tax dollars in doing, only to ignore the studies that they have. 
you shouldn't be in solitary confinement more than, what, 15, 30 days because it causes mental illness. You have total sensory deprivation. Um, all of us know that as human beings, we need human contact. And they're not receiving that. I haven't been able to touch, hug, or kiss my son in over six years. When I visit him, I get one hour behind plexiglass. And they're very careful that I only get that one hour. And sometimes they even short me on that. Um, so they're not even following the recommendations that from their own studies, they choose to ignore those. The fourth thing they asked for was provide adequate uh, food and nutrition. We all need to be healthy and, and have, to be able to feel like we've eaten in a day. Sometimes when I sit and have a meal, I will start crying because I know that my son is not being adequately fed. And when you're in solitary confinement, you don't get a quarterly package that helps supplement your food. You get one package a year. And they will add the humiliation to you and the additional expense of if that package gets there before it's supposed to, they will send it back to the company. I've had that done before because it was like a couple of weeks too early. It's supposed to be in December. He got it in November. It went back. Uh, the last one they asked for is expand and provide constructive programming and privileges for indefinite shoe status inmates. My son describes his existence in there as nothingness. This is the landfill fill of humanity. They had no programming. They had, they weren't allowed many times to have certain books and things of that nature. And if it hadn't been for the 2011 hunger strike, and the, um, they would never have been able to even, now I can say I do try and give, to show what their struggle does do to help them. What them, my son losing 30 pounds over, a, over 30 pounds during a four, the four weeks of the hunger strike that he was able to participate, you know, did for him. They were able to get, be able to do correspondence for college, and so he's been doing that. But so many of them have been so broken down and so disappointed when trying to help themselves, trying to improve themselves. And why CDC ever added the R for rehabilitation, I could, and they, they went to extra lengths to add that R. And they were doing nothing for um, rehabilitation. So that's the um, fifth thing that they have asked for. They want to be better, do better, be productive. And CDC is inhibiting that in every way that they can. But thank God for the struggle that they went through, putting their lives on the line, losing the life of one inmate, um, so that they could bring this attention to the public and so that people could be there to so support them and so that we could be out there and be their voices. And I thank everyone that's here to be educated and understand what the struggle is and what there's, they're going through and what the families are going through because it is devastating and isolating. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maribel, and um, I've been with CFAS since 2011 when um, me and my family, we're from San Diego, we, got, we all got into, the, into our car and um, I drove to Los Angeles, about a three hour drive, and we just, you know, looked for parking, we didn't even know where to park, we used GPS, got there, and started rallying. Uh, we saw, we, we didn't know anyone at that moment, 
and um, it was right, you know, right as um, they were, you know, on hunger strike. My uncle was in a, in the hunger strike, and you know, we saw all these women protesting, and we're like, you know, well, you know, we have to do this too. We have to keep coming. So all to th all the rest of 2011, we were driving up and down from San Diego to Los Angeles, um, you know, going to all the rallies and protests, and just trying to, you know, figure out what to do next or what we could do. And at that moment we thought like, oh, you know, something's gonna happen. This is like a big deal. We're like protesting in front of the LA County Jail. We're like marching around, you know, you know, getting, me a, we were getting a little media attention too. And we figured like, oh, you know, by the end of this year, after, you know, maybe the third or fourth or fifth um, rally, you know, we're gonna get answers. Well, you know, it's 2014 and we're still here. Uh, we're, we're definitely never gonna stop. And um, right on. yeah, we're definitely never going to stop here because um, our family members haven't stopped. My uncle has been at Pelican Bay for in solitary confinement for 15 years, oh. and um, I have I can't say I can remember interacting with him as a child because uh, I'm I'm 26, and you know he grew up in LA. We you know I grew up in San Diego. So yeah, we'd visit, but you know, he's, he's you know, in his 20s at that time. Of course, he wasn't living at home or anything. So, you know, he was, you know, on doing his life, doing his life and everything. So, we I kept I didn't keep the, in contact with him as a child, of course, but my mom, my grandmother would write to him. I had no idea, you know, where he was. I knew he was in prison. Um, I was close to him because of, you know, what my mom and what my grandmother told me and with my, you know, my family, you know, we're close. So, you know, that's where the love came from. And when I found out what he was going through, it's like, you know, it's like I, I was with him throughout his whole life and my family, my family member, you know, was in solitary confinement and it really hit me like, like how can they be doing this to him? You know, or to, to all the other men too and women that are in solitary confinement and teenagers you know there's like they don't there's not a limit to who they're going to put in solitary confin confinement it's who can they who else can they put in solitary right. confinement right. and um and so i was a, i for the first time in i don't know how long um i was able to visit him in 2012 and he hadn't received a visit for seven years because oh. Because you know, it's like driving is about a 14 hour drive, right? Just 14, one way. yeah, one way, 14 hour drive, one way, and um, you know, you have to make plans for it. Like, I would have never even dreamed about going because well, I'm like, how would I even get there? Thanks to CFAST, you know, we've been sending family members, I was able to go and visit him, and um, it's just it's just incredible, like, just that happiness that it gives them to see a, their family member that they haven't seen in such a long time. It's, it, it's difficult for families to get up there. Um, and you know, I was blessed to go. Um, but uh, it's, you know, now that I know about the issue and I write to my uncle, you know, and write to him like throughout the hunger strike, um, there was nowhere in that letter did he ever say, you know, I'm being forced to do this. He, it's more like the circumstances are what force them to do these drastic, you know, these drastic things. And um, it's, it's incredible how they were able to organize, you know, 30,000 prisoners. Like, and I, we were talking about it, and I'm like, did you ever call, you know, at least a hundred of those prisoners and tell them, oh, you know, there's going to be a hunger strike on this day. Let's, you know, let's. Uh, start mobilizing and everything. No, it was them. They were the ones that were able to organize and know, you know, it's like everyone, you know, fr with their free will knew that this had to be done. And um, it's like really important that people find out what happened and what's going on, what's going on at this moment, you know? All these prisoners in solitary confinement and how without people speaking up about it, you know, there's no way there there will be an end. That's you know, right. they're they're using everything they can. They're using their whole their whole bodies. You know, their lives. They're putting their lives out there, 
And if it were up to uh, CDCR, and you know, are the R is always in quotes, you know, if I even mention it at all. But um, if it were for them, they'd probably stop. They'd probably stop all the letters that we even sent to our family members, so they won't know about the conditions in solitary confinement. Um, you know, that's that, that's that's how I feel about it. That's how I feel about solitary confinement, and you know, that's the reason I'm here. Uh, there's just like there's so much that 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 I still don't know about, and um, I feel like people think they they read you know we read we read articles we read this and that, but it's happening. It really is happening to people, you know, mm -hmm. at this moment. That's right. You know, right now my uncle is in his cell that has no windows. It's I, I, I almost try to imagine it as like if, like if you're sitting in a bathroom because there's their sink is there, their toilets there, and there's like, you know, a a bed, which is just like a, a cement slate or something, and I can imagine like sitting in the bathroom without all those nice decorations that we usually have in our bathrooms, just white walls and the fluorescent light, and just sitting there. That's it. Maybe you know in the morning they'll come and drop off breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then the day goes on. The next day comes around, same thing. And you know, you can, I can only think about that for so long because it's, it hurts. It hurts to think about it. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I'm talking about my uncle, who I haven't seen since I was a child. I can't even remember hugging him. And I, and you know, I don't know how long they're gonna keep him in there. Like, it's just, I can't imagine the, the pain that these ladies next to me are going through. Because that's their, their little boys, you know? Those are their, their little boys. Okay. Well, you know, that's you know, that's that's what I can say about how how it's really affecting us, you know, as as a family member, as a person, and in a way, I feel blessed that that I'm you know a family member of a person who is in solitary confinement and went on you know went on the participated on the hunger strike because I can you know tell people share this information with people who might not have that connection. You know, who might not have that, and you know, they should be blessed that one of their family members hasn't been in solitary confinement. But they should also think about the fact that there could be, if not themselves, someone in their family that can end up in solitary confinement. I mean, prisons aren't getting smaller, they're creating more prisons. That's where all the funding is going. And, you know, like, it, it, it affects each and every one of us. You know, we're supporting a system. We're paying to keep people isolated 23 hours a day. And, and um, I just want to, I also want to say, I also want to talk about um, the debriefing process that Dalitha was talking about. Um, it's not, it's, they don't put them in solitary confinement because of the crime that got them in there. Um, they put them in there for, you know, political activism, for drawings like her, like um, Dalitha son, for, you know, an Aztec drawing. And even now, it's, it's up to the, it's up to the CEO's discretion. Um, I've heard I've heard of stories of other family members where their their family member had you know all these drawings and whatever all these things in their possession and they were still in general general population, but because of whatever reason, whether it was because they were in the hunger strike or you know they felt like oh yeah this person needs to go in solitary just because they wanted to, 
even though that those drawings were okay before, that you know they became validated for those same drawings that were allowed, and it's just it just it just goes to show that there's not really you know like due process. You know they're not gonna and if there is when they go up to see you know like like an issue they go they you know bring up an issue. It's the same uh, correctional officers, the CEOs that are handling those cases. So if you get, you know, if the person that's going to read your case or read your complaint he believes that, you know, well, if that per if that, that's the same person that, um, that, you know, you're upset about, it's basically a joke. What, what are those called? Those, um, those like complaints? The 602s? The 602s, yeah. So it's basically, yeah, it's basically a joke. And it's a joke, you know, to them, to the CEOs, and, and um, prisoners know that it's a joke. It's completely useless. And there needs to be, you know, people in there, there needs to be people in there that, you know, can, can look at that information and look at all that stuff and, um, you know, have an unbiased, like, opinion. And um, I mean, there would be so there'd be a lot less people in solitary confinement if the prison didn't control every single thing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Chandra Delaney, and I am the mother of one of the Dollar Six, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. I'm a member of Human Rights Coalition, and I'm also a board member of the Abolitionist Law Center, and this is from Pits Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, the Human <coughs> Rights Coalition was founded by prisoners, ex-prisoners, family members, and activists. And we all came together to fight for human and civil rights of prisoners. And one of our goals is to abolish solitary confinement and to eventually abolish prison altogether. Part of our work consists of documenting abuse, which happens mainly in solitary confinement, and assisting jailhouse lawyers and with filing legal complaints. And HRC, what we really want to do is empower family members to be the advocates for their loved ones. And we also want to start a movement with family members um, advocating for their loved ones. The Abolitionist, the Abolitionist Law Center is a public interest law firm which is inspired by the struggle of political and politicized prisoners. And they organize for the purpose of abolishing class and race-based mass incarceration in the United States. Abolitionist Law Center litigates on behalf of people whose human rights have been violated in prison. They produce educational um, programs to inform the public about mass incarceration. And they're working on developing a mass movement by building alliances and on all social um, Solidar solidarity across all social divisions. And ALC and HRC work closely together, and we have a shared vision of the prison abolition and social justice. Um, HRC has been um, really in solidarity with the California hunger strikers because through the letters that we receive from prisoners, a lot of our prisoners are doing hunger strikes, and even some of the Dallas Six members have individually done hunger strikes at one time, but no one has ever had an organized hunger strike. And so we are in solidarity because um, we need to know, you know, what's, how they did theirs, <laughs> and so that our hunger strikers in Pennsylvania can be more effective <laughs> since it's, this is something that they really want to do. Um, I um, know of a couple personal instances of hunger strikers. Um, Miss Donna Hill, sitting back here, she was on another panel. Her husband, he has done more than one hunger strike. And he just um, completed a hunger strike, I believe it was back in November, where he was, he was near death's door. And in our state, they really don't care 
they they really want you to die. They they really don't care. They want you to die so that that can be an example to the other prisoners. That's really what they want to do. Um, like I said, uh, um, uh, HRC is has a three point platform to abolish solitary, and it it was just the things that they were talking about. A lot of it is in our three point platform. Um, um, point number three, I mean point number one rather, is that solitary confinement is torture because the practice of confining someone in a tiny cell for 22 to, to 24 hours a day in itself is torture and like she was saying, you're depriving people of human contact and it's a, you know, it's, it's in a short time, it's two weeks, someone can, you know, become mentally, you know, ill and approximately 50% of suicides occur in solitary confinement. And another reason why we feel that it should be abolished is because it targets prisoners of color. And it's widely used as retaliation against those who file lawsuits or speak out against their, you know, human rights violations that have occurred to them. Um, male and female prisoners are physically, psychologically, and sexually abused by guards and denied basic needs such as meal, shower, water, and visits. When my son went in at 18, I was so worried about the gang violence of Bloods and Crips until I found out it was no problem with Bloods and Crips. It was problems with the correction officers, that gang. They were the ones that were doing all the damage. <laughs> Um, point two of our um, platform is that solitary confinement is a threat to public safety. At least 80,000 prisoners are held in solitary confinement. In Pennsylvania, there's at least 2,500 people in um, solitary confinement. They have no access to mental health care. From what the prisoners tell us, the um, psychiatrist goes by and says, are you okay? And keeps moving. Um, when prisoners are kept in solitary confinement, and then they're returned into general population, it usually results in violence because they've been, they've been in the cell and then they've been aggressively treated by guards. So they usually have to keep them in a single cell and it can, you know, when they come out, they create violence and what happens, they use the violence that they did to put them back in um, the solitary confinement. And then it's also used to intimidate and repress and so many people are in this situation and then they are released back they're released back out into society and they have not had any type of therapy so once they get into the communities then you know they're they're, they're going to react violently out in the community so that's why it's a threat to our public safety um point number three is that solitary confinement confinement must be abolished Solitary confinement has become the dominant weapon in the war on black and brown prisoners. Solitary, these words are in, in here. Solitary is a war on our brothers, sisters, yes. parents, children, yes. families, and friends behind the wall. Torture is a crime and a serious threat, and it must be abolished. The rampant use of solitary confinement must be stopped. No other country in the world uses solitary confinement as much as the United States. And other states have already taken steps to, to reduce its use. So HRC is just asking everyone in society <laughs> to come together so that we can build a society that respects the rights of all people, values rehabilitation, and does not believe in throwaway people. As I mentioned, I'm the mother of one of the Dollar Six. And the Dollar Six are six young men who went through all of this stuff that, um, that the other um, women were talking about. These guys have been abused. They have been um, tortured. They have been neglected of meals. They have been starved. Um, like my son, he, he became a jailhouse lawyer and an activist. And most of the Dollar Six are jailhouse lawyers and activists, which is part of the reason 
why they were in solitary and mm. continue to be in solitary. Um, most of these men have been in solitary for at least 10 years. My son um, is 10 years over his venom because they kept him in solitary confinement so long. In Pennsylvania, when, once you get in solitary, you cannot see the parole board. So if your time comes to see the parole board, your time, wow. you know, you just miss your time. So wow. he's, he's over his minimum. Mm -hmm. Now the story of what happened with the Dallas Six back in April in 2010, the Human Rights Coalition did a report on all of the um, information that we were receiving from prisoners at SEI Dallas. So once that report was completed, it was sent back into the prison, you know, just for the prisoners to view. And what happened, nobody thought to black names out. It was read and, you know, once the administration found the names of all the people, they began a rampage of torture against all the inmates that had um, submitted information. So um, one by one, they were going in cells, taking the, they put on riot gear, and one by one, they were going in cells, taking the, taking, beating prisoners or whatever. And um, one prisoner, Isaac Sanchez, they had poisoned him, and they put him in a restraint chair and held him in a restraint chair overnight. And you're only supposed to be in this chair for like two hours. And he could have like lost his hands. They said he was all blue and he could have like lost his hands and his, and his legs. So when the guards told the Dollar Six men that they were going to be next, all of the guys, you know, they knew that harm was coming. So they barricaded their doors and they covered their cell window because when you're in solitary, if you cover your window, it means that a higher up person has to come, come down. So once they sent the higher up person down um, and asked the guys to remove the covering, all the guys told them that they wanted outside intervention. They wanted someone from the DA's office, you know, anybody from the outside who they could report to what was happening to them. So they said basically the guards told them, you must be crazy if you know we're going to let somebody come in here, you know, and know what we're doing. So what the guards did was go upstairs. We have, we have the videos. Look, somehow my son, like two years ago, sent me his video. And once it was legally out, they, they had, we have all the videos of everybody's um, extraction. But what happened, the guards went and put on their, their little, they call it, the, the guys called the Star Wars outfit. They put that on and came down and I mean, you could see on the video, they were coming up to the guy's cell. The guys weren't like cursing. They were, you know, they were like, no, sir, you know, we're not taking it down until you get somebody. So one by one, they went into the cells. Um, they tear gassed the guys. They pepper sprayed them. They were tasing them on their genitals. Um, I mean, that one of the guys, they even walked him down. They. They stripped him and made him walk naked through down the corridor, so you know to humiliate, humiliate him, and so everybody could see, you know, what you know what um, to make an example of him. Um, after after this happened, um, the guys were um, emergency evacuated to other prisons, except for one guy. And after that, there was a complaint filed. Um, a criminal complaint filed against the prison. And my son filed a complaint against the DA of that county, which is Luzerne County, Kiss for Cash County. And they, the district attorney and the um, state police took all the information they received from the complaint and they filed a riot charge against the guys. So the guys are being charged with riot and they're, they have been going through the court system for four years and have not had a trial yet. And all the guys are their own attorney. And they're doing, these guys are doing an excellent job. One of these guys even won a $185,000 lawsuit against the DLC for abusing him. But they're still abusing him. Um, just to close, I just wanted to say that they could use RHU, SMU, and any other acronym that they can to describe solitary confinement. But what it really is, is a modern day dungeon, a torture chamber or a death chamber for some 
because you might die by suicide or you might die by murder from the guards. It is a tool used to break the spirits of men and women and it is mostly used for retaliation. For those who feel that torture is justified, I always say, once you're adjudicated, you may lose your rights to live in a free society, but you do not lose your civil rights and you do not use, lose your human rights. So, those of us in this country that point out the violations of others, I mean, I'm sorry, the U.S. is a country that points out human and civil rights violations of others. Meanwhile, they have more of their own citizens in bondage under this torturous and extreme conditions than anyone else. It is time for us to have a national grassroots movement from the East Coast to the West Coast and it is time to abolish solitary and shut down every unit in this country. Yeah. 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 Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, I would just like to begin with, you know, July 1st, 2011. July 1st, 2011 was the first hunger strike that took place in the state of California that 6,000 prisoners participated in and it spread across 13 prisons. When I became involved at this time, I just wanted to know when my son was going to eat. I read the demands, I looked at the issues, but I thought, okay, but somebody tell me when is my son going to eat. As I became involved, as I began to realize that my son is being held without a window, without the human contact. This was something I knew, but never actually gave it much thought. This was something I knew and just kind of thought it's all going to work out somehow. And he had already been in solitary confinement for a decade. And I had already, I had already began with the numbness process of, well, they have to let him out someday. You know, just accepting it as that's the way that it is. And what I saw what I realized in solitary confinement, the despair, the hopelessness, the oppression, but what I realized was the strength, the tenacity, the courage of the hunger strikers that came together in unity, black, brown, north, south. For decades long, CDC had instilled in these human beings that you must fight against one another, that you must kill one another, because that's also something that that's just the way it is. You would have 20 year olds not even realizing why they were supposed to fight against one another, but that's just the way it is. Just like my son was being held in solitary confinement, and that's how it is. You know, people continue to get locked up. We build more prisons, and that's just the way it is. And one thing that I realized, all of you here right now, I was thinking of this as we were having this panel, would be validated. All of you here right now in the state of California would be held in solitary confinement. And do you know why? Because you're organizers, because you're activists, because you are creating a movement, you are involved in a movement, and you are wanting to do something about issues, or I really don't believe you'd be at the left forum. So all of you know that you would be in solitary confinement. And in California, because this is the guise that they use in California, it's the gang. It's the indefinite shoe term, and indefinite literally means just that. It means 20 and 30 years. We have prisoners right now in our database that have been held in isolation for decades, all under the guise of the gang validation process. No actual evidence of a rules violation report, no actual act against another prisoner or a guard, but under the guise, and all of them, obviously, because they have created a movement to bring an end of solitary confinement, all of them are activists and organizers, wouldn't you say? Because then began the second hunger strike that occurred September 26, 2011. In that second hunger strike, 12,000 prisoners participated. And then in the third hunger strike, July 13th, July 8th, 2013, 30,000 prisoners, the largest hunger strike in the world. At first I was saying in the United States, but actually in the world. And why? Because they have found that in peaceful protest to create a movement, they must rise up, they must take a stand against the oppression that the system has created. And in doing that in unity, it has opened my eyes to so much that in California, we have the three security housing units, but every prison 
in the state of California has administrative segregation housing units. And these administrative segregation housing units, they are not allowed any property. It's three cement walls with a metal door. And they consider this as um, a detainment for punishment. But under the guise of the indefinite, they're waiting for shoe cells to open. So they also sit in these conditions for two and three years and think nothing of it. And you know, I was showing the girls earlier because in the state of California, there was a big proposition over the chickens. There was a big to-do in 2008 over the conditions of confinement for chickens. They felt that chickens didn't have enough room to spread their wings. So California, they got busy and they passed a, bi they passed a bill for the conditions of chickens. So all of our eggs in California have cage-free, range-free on the carton of eggs. And the other day I was really looking at my carton of eggs and it's literally certified humane. It has a stamp, the seal of California, certified humane because the chickens were allowed to be part of their natural habitat, their natural behaviors were not taken away from them. But yet what are we doing to our human beings in California? We're depriving them from holding one another's hand. We're depriving them from hold, having a conversation where you're able to look at somebody in the eye. Because when you look, when you're in your cell, even when you look out your middle door, all you see is a cement slab across from you. That's it. You don't ever get the opportunity to look at another person in their eye and hold a conversation. What we have begun with California <laughs> Families Against Solitary Confinement with our movement is growing the family movement, um, encouraging families to get involved, to speak out, to, to policy making, advocating, and, and not accepting this as the conditions any lo longer, not accepting it as this is just the way it is, this is just the way we hold human beings. You know, staying active and asking other people to get involved. We've learned from the prisoners, I will be totally honest, um, during their third hunger strike, uh, they created a list of 40 demands this time and I said, I, I got a little bit exasperated and I said, what are they thinking? We have, can't even get the five demands met and you know now they have 40 demands and now they want to speak for the oppressed around the world and I became overwhelmed and I thought they all have shoe syndrome because we're not going to get this and I will say that out of those 40 demands they have gotten at least half of those. You know, and so I look at them, I look at their courage, I look at their tenacity and I do take their leadership in a lot of ways. I do look at their suggestions as seriously because they are the ones entombed in this isolation. They know how to change things, what can make things better. At Pelican Bay, we used to have one hour. We used to have to drive, as she said, 15 hours. You know, drive up because it's in such an isolated area. It's on the very border of Oregon. So going from California to go visit, and they said, you know, the, the prisoners said, look at what our family members and loved ones go through to drive up here. We want, you know, more visiting hour. And so now we have the three hour. But are we okay with these things? No, because are they giving, these, giving us these things so you can live more comfortably the next 20 years in solitary confinement? So even though these changes are made and we do see it as progress, we are still, we have so much farther to go because we don't see our mission completed until there is is an end to the use of indefinite solitary confinement till there is an end to the use of holding people you know captive for decades at a time and um I do have a habit of saying my son has only been in solitary confinement for 13 years because I now am surrounded by family members that their loved ones have literally been in solitary confinement for 20 years, 30 years. And this is our reality. This is our existence. We get our strength from one another. We encourage one another. Do we always get along? Heck no. Because we're people. We're people just like these prisoners are. And what has shown me, do we always even get along as activists, as organizers, as, as people uh, involved in this? No, we're not always going to agree. But if you have men that had to kill each other for decades, now coming together, even in their disagreements, even after everything, and working together to build, to move forward, to create, to change things, how not much more can we? So I look at it as the family members, the academics, the activists, the lawyers, all of us coming together and working together to make change, and because change is possible, and I have seen that by their efforts. And so I just really want to thank everybody for being here.